Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events, and we would like to thank you for joining us uh, for our program with Richard Brandy for his new book, Garden Neighborhoods of San Francisco, The Development of Resident Residence Parks. 1905 to 1924. Before we begin, I'd like to find out how many of you are new to the Mechanics Institute. We have all members here or friends. Wonderful. If you are new or if you would like to bring a friend who's new, um, please tell them to come Wednesday and give us a tour of our library and the Mechanics Institute building. Librarians will give you a great history of background, and also the great tour of the library and the chess room, and everything we have under one roof. Also, today's talk will be followed by a Q&A with you, our audience, and then uh, Richard will have his book for sale uh, and signing afterwards. So, uh, between 1905 and 1924, at least 36 San Francisco residents' parks such as St. Francis Wood and Seacliff, were planned with a feeling of living in a, in a park in mind. This historic book combines architecture, landscape, urban design, and also the green of our cities. And so there's no better topic to be speaking about today. Richard Brandy is a historic preservation consultant, evaluating hundreds of buildings and sites from federal and state agencies and local organizations. He is the author of three books, including San Francisco's West Portal Neighborhoods for the Images of America series, and also St. Francis Wood. He is the current president of the Northern California chapter of Society of Architectural Historians, and also was a board member of the Western Neighborhoods Project for 20 years. So we'd like to welcome Richard Brandy to tell us all about our neighborhoods. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've never actually been in the Mechanics Institute uh, as a member, but uh, it's a very, very old institution and it's done a lot of good work. So, I'm very happy to be here, and I know it's a high involvement audience. You guys know a lot about history, and uh, it's, so you'll probably, I hope I won't put you to sleep, it'll be something interesting and something maybe something that, that you weren't aware of. So, what is a residence park? Uh, it's a term that was popular in the early 20th century, but it kind of fell out of favor. It really wasn't used after a while. Um, but the concept was to uh, bring sort of the feeling of living in the country but when you were still in the city, in this case, San Francisco. So there's some characteristics of a residence park, at least in San Francisco. This is the goal. This is what the developers do. So they would often have a picture of streets, you know, curving streets, um, detached single family houses. That was really a very important feature of all of these. There was a setbacks from the sidewalk and side setbacks, so that there would be room for landscaping. Uh, there were custom designs by architects, at least at first, the first few years. This is very unusual in San Francisco and even anywhere in the world to have, in this case, there's 7,500 houses were ultimately built, almost all of those by architects. Uh, not that that means it's necessarily good, but in this period of time, I think you, you, when you see these houses, they're all very well designed and well made. Uh, as I said, landscaping was very important to all of them, and some of them had their own little parks or playgrounds. So again, you would be you wouldn't have to go far to get that kind of recreation. They all very important. They had to have transit downtown. These were not built for super, the super rich that could, you know, commute by carriage or private automobile. These were people that worked uh, in, in, that, in this meant downtown. There was no remote work. 
so you had to go into the office. So transit was very important. But they were people who could afford a custom house, or at least a single family house. So they were professional uh, businessmen and uh, in other professions. I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. And then they all had deed restrictions that when you bought the lot, you were not allowed to, well, you could not be, and the terms vary depending on development, but you couldn't be African American or Asian. Or could you couldn't rent there as, as well. And uh, it was uh, written into the deed, so that's a private uh, enforcement. It wasn't the city that, that decided this. This wasn't a zoning thing. This was a deed restriction done by the developers. It was just common nationwide for these residence parks, which was a nationwide phenomenon. But also, this kind of discrimination was common at the time in other uh, developments that were not residence parks. So they were not the only ones doing this, unfortunately. So here's where we have San Francisco before the idea of residence parks, you know, very dense city, Victorian city, uh, with no greenery, no street trees. Um, and uh, the uh, impetus for the residence parks was to, to give people an alternative from this sort of, sort of uh, living. And where are you going to do this? Uh, you need more land to do these residence parks because you've got detached houses, it takes more land. And so at the turn of the century, um, the what this map is dated 1900, the western half of San Francisco, as you can see, there's almost no streets. And there was nothing out there. This was the sunset, future sunset Richmond, and actually the future Golden Gate Park, um, which was um, uh, vacant. And so you'll see most of the residence parks are built in some part of the western part of San Francisco. Uh, this, this just shows you, in case you didn't <laughs> believe me, that there were sand dunes. It seems incredible now. Uh, but the uh, much of this area was uh, looked like this. Uh, this is Laguna Honda Hospital uh, uh, around 1906. It's had a series of different buildings over its very long history. And I just show this because this is shows uh, shows uh, the Twin Peaks here, which have no trees. And this is Sutro's forest, which I, I'm sure you all know about Adolf Sutro and his tree planting in the 1880s. And it's quite dramatic here. And I mentioned transit to downtown. So when the Twin Peaks tunnel was built, this was a huge moment in the development of San Francisco, because you remember after 1906, the city was desperate for city leaders, desperate to regain the population that moved to the East Bay, in many cases in a form of residence parks too, because the East Bay was ahead of us in this uh, concept. Anyway, so transit's very important. This is West Portal uh, in 1917. Uh, but the very first residence park in San Francisco was Presidio Terrace in 1905. And this, in a way, set the, the model for the future of residence parks. At least that's what developers hope to achieve. But this is unusual in a couple of ways. It was designed from the beginning for millionaires. This was going to be a rich man's, rich person's place. And the streets are privately owned. And I, I know you probably heard about a few years ago, the residents did, didn't know that they were supposed to pay property taxes on their streets, and it was sold to somebody else. It was a brouhaha. And there are gates. There are gates to, uh, to uh, Presidio Terrace, uh, which never used to be closed in, in my lifetime, but they, I think they still sort of keep them open. But it is, a, it is, it could be a gated community, and the streets are won by the association. And that and the fact that it was designed really for the super wealthy is a little bit unusual for residence parks in San Francisco. But the idea of this, you know, detached houses in a really lush uh, environment is, is was the, is the, uh, uh, the model, and it, it sold slowly until after 1906, and then of course everything sold much more quickly as a kind of rebuilding. 
The house on the left is the, uh, I think you recognize it as the then Mayor Einstein's house uh, and uh, Senator. Uh, but before that, it was uh, owned by a builder, Fernando Nelson. He actually built it. He, well, he had it, but he didn't build it. He hired architects. But in any case, so I mentioned that uh, the residence parks are on the west side of San Francisco. So, and I, you know, this, this is becoming my life's work to, to talk about residence parks. So I had known about some of them before, and I thought, how many are there? Because I keep running into more and more. So I got a publisher interested in the idea of doing a book about it. So as I mentioned, I found 36, and we mapped them out. And the book's kind of a planning history of where they ended up, who designed and what happened to them. You know, how did they, because a lot of people know that, don't know they're in a residence park, or it doesn't look like it, but it was going to be or should have been or was trying to be anyway. But they were in the West, although they um, were also, um, even in the marina and in Visitation Valley, which as a site like I grew up there and I had no idea that there was, it was a site of going to be a residence park in Visitation Valley, which Visitation Valley has been a lot of things, but it's never been a residence park. Anyway, uh, even like you said, um, so the residence parks were going to promise you things you couldn't get unless you were very wealthy, such as quiet streets, landscaping, detached houses. This, this is like a manner I was mentioning oh, to, um, okay, I forgot your name. Um, yes. A dramatic views. This is sea cliff before the trees and before other houses. If you stand there now, you can't see the Golden Gate quite like that, but at the time you could, and it's quite dramatic, of course, to, to be able to live there. And of course, there's no bridge because this is about 1916. Um, marine views, and uh, when I read the ads, they, they would often talk about marine views, and I thought, well, I need to know that neighborhood. I don't think you can see the ocean from there, but you can, and they interpreted marine view as any. Look, uh, if you could see the ocean from anywhere in the track, this is uh, Ashbury Terrace, which is a, a very lovely small uh, track, and there is a there is a, a a view of the Golden Gate from some of these houses. I'm standing on someone's stairs at this point just to get this photo, but the people in the houses across the street in the back must have great, fantastic views. Uh, city views. This is a very odd Ashbury Park, uh, an odd one uh, that, that also tried to become a residence park. But city views, or selling features, private parks. There's really only a couple that really do were able to do this because it takes land that you otherwise could not sell lots on so for the developer to do this. Entrance portals. You see this a lot. They almost all have some kind of statuary brick stucco, some kind of entrance pillars to let you know that, hey, this is going to be a nice neighborhood. Right now, it might be sand, there might be nothing here but streets, but trust us, we're going to we're putting some money into making this a, 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 a good neighborhood. Even a, a sculptures, even in uh, one case, a sundial, this is an Eagle Sign Terraces, and if you're familiar with that part of town, you know, the Western Half of San Francisco is not exactly known for the sun, uh, but here we have the sundial <laughs> and the side terraces. And it's clearly was a promotional thing. This is great. You can go online to the uh, Western Neighborhoods Project website, and there's a bunch of stories about when this was dedicated. But again, this is something you wouldn't find if you're, you know, going in the Western Edition trying to find a house, you know, or rural houses. Not that there's anything wrong with the Western Edition row of houses, but this is different. Even Crocker Amazon, which is out way out of mission, um, uh, and it's really for working class houses, it's not an expensive uh, development, but they had this um, uh, pergola at the entrance, uh, which uh, lasted about well, maybe, t maybe 20 years or so, 15 years. Uh, it's not there now, but the, the street is still wide, and now, recently, uh, DPW put some landscaping. Uh, fountains, 
St. Francis Wood I, I, I has the most fountains per capita, I think, of anywhere. It, has, it had three water function features. Again, in an area that you don't really need the cooling uh, function of a, of a waterfall, but it, you know, it's a very nice grand thing. I might add that fountain is a duplicate of one in the East Bay that the same developer uh, used, um, Mason uh, Duncan McDuffie. Uh, and it got hit by a car like the one in Berkeley. So uh, that's his repair. When I was doing the book on St. Francis Wood, it did get hit while we were doing the book, but we had a photo before. So um, anyway. Uh, custom house designs I mentioned. This is Sea Cliff. You'll see the curved street here. Uh, but then after these were all launched, uh, we're just around before World War I, with great anticipation. And during the First World War, it was the, the wars really killed the real estate business, and actually nationwide, even before the United States got in the war. It caused a lot of financial difficulties. So they kind of struggled through World War I. And then in the 20s, they realized, the developers realized, listen, we're asking too much of people to not only buy a lot, but then find an architect, find somebody, a contract, and then you have to finance it yourself. You know, some people could do it, but that's asking a lot. So by the 20s, uh, they, almost all the developers went to a different model where they either uh, had a standardized design for the track, it's still arch architect design, but you would just change the, the chroma mode to give you some variety. This is St. Mary's Park, which is um, way out on Mission Street. On the grounds of the much older St. Mary's College, the original St. Mary's College of 1860s, I think. Anyway, so as I mentioned, 36 projects. Uh, there were 14 different developers, usually by today's standards, very much mom and pop. These are very small ish companies, not publicly traded, uh, limited capital. Um, they, but they employ, employ, employ 10 track or supervising architect. So the, the architect would make sure that whatever was being built was copacetic, that met the designs of the of the residence park. As I mentioned, there are dozens of architects involved. Uh, two landscape architects, the Olmsted brothers, uh, the famous sons of uh, the, the, um, the Olmsted of Central Park, and a firm that was very influential for about 100 years or more. And Mark Daniels is a local boy who was very, very involved in a lot of these things. He's quite a character, and I have more to say about him later. Uh, I mentioned lots of architects is rare, initially custom houses, and then they realized that wasn't really going too well, so they would give you free plans by the track architect if you bought a lot. So, uh, they would build houses on speculation, so you could just see the house. And uh, like I mentioned, track designs. And I should back up the, the initially when uh, having selling you a lot, you know, and having you do the rest sounds like a, a, a asking a lot now. But what they were doing was selling you a completely improved lot. All the streets were in, the sidewalks, all the utilities were in, and that was at the turn of the century. That was a, a, unusual for the developer to do that. Um, many times the property owner had to pave the street either themselves or split the cost of the city and utilities. You know. So this was all done. So this was an improvement, but then even then it wasn't uh, quite enough to get people to uh, fully subscribe to these uh, residence parks. Um, I'm gonna just go through a very brief rundown of some of the different architectural styles. And I start by saying that the residence parks have, uh, there's no uh, required style that they have to follow. You could build any in any style as long as you follow the setbacks and you know landscaping requirements. And usually it couldn't be more than two stories, it had to be single family. Um, and so people, you know, asked their architects to build what was popular at the time, which is generally sort of this period revival. Historical styles are very uh, popular now. This is after Victorian. The Spanish Colonial is maybe the, the most popular of all the residence parks, and it was in California to a large extent. Uh, but you see U.S. Colonial style as well. Some Tudor, or at least some wood stuck in the uh, 
of stucco to make it look like Tudor. Now, I, I am not being, I shouldn't be facetious because as if these architects really did a good job, they were trained, um, you know, in a classical way or a traditional way. And these are all usually very good designs in terms of the plan, the program, you know, circulation and whatnot. Um, and all of, there are no pure styles, you know, these are all influenced by historical styles. And it was up to the customer, you know, to really approve the, the specific plan. So, so you see a lot of variety. Some French uh, craftsmen, of course, that was a, a very popular at that time period. So you see some craftsmen as well in the residence parks. And then this, what's uh, getting architecturally historical here, uh, this first day tradition, which is uh, not so easy to define, but if you think of uh, Bernard Maybeck and sort of a fusion of different influences of arts and crafts, sort of English cottage, even an Asian, Japanese influence in some of these. Um, and so there are, there is a, a, a again, a rich, rich mixture of styles. Um, this is just for people who recognize some of the architects that were active in residence parks. It's a who's who of all the notable uh, uh, Bay Area architects at the time. And it's important to know, you know, I, I call it a simpler age. There was, uh, which it was, it was just less of everything. There was really no environmental plan or planning on land use laws uh, of really of any kind. There was no affordability requirements. There was no anti-discrimination rules. There was no public involvement. You didn't have the 300 foot by your neighbor that you couldn't do so. Um, I never found any lawsuits uh, that caught at all. So there was any delay was just based on the economics and, you know, of the developer. Um, and they took all the risk and they were incredibly fast because they usually could build these from buying raw land to you know building the first house was maybe three years and includes all the streets and everything. You did have to submit a plan, a subdivision plan to the city, and the streets had to meet certain requirements. So you could just do any old thing you wanted, but let's see what's the next one. Uh, but um, the city was very eager and welcomed and loved these developments because the developers were doing what the city considered very high class housing. These were these were really model communities. The city wanted to recover and get population back from the East Bay and grow. So. They, they were not, they were sort of acting hand in glove. I didn't find any corruption thing that, uh, at least not in the papers. This is the time of um, the chief engineer uh, O'Shaughnessy and Mayor Rolf, and they were a team. They were sort of a good government types and sort of clean after the thing, the scandals of the previous administration, too. Um, but anyway, and they worked with the developers. These are the bigger ones. Baldwin and Hal did. Um, big old line firm, and they started us off here with Presidio Terrace. But they also then did, which is kind of strange, Mission Terrace, which is on San Jose Avenue, um, but sort of by Balboa Park, and that was deliberately designed for the working class. These are modest town houses. Uh, and then they also did Westwood Park, which is sort of a middle, between sort of a, a, a middle class house. So they, they did a variety of uh, projects on their own, as well as sell to some of these other developers. And I'm not going to read the list here. Um, but these were what I would call the professional developers. They've been in business a long time. They knew what they were doing. Uh, then there were the family-run businesses, which also knew what they were doing. But they weren't quite as sophisticated. And they did a lot of the work themselves. Fernando Nelson and Son, I'm sure you've heard that name. Uh, I don't see a lot of shaking hands, but um, a Victorian builder built a lot of homes in the mission uh, and as he, uh, became uh, more successful and wealthier. He also branched into the residence parks business and, and, and uh, launched a couple of them. Joseph Leonard from actually from Alameda, he was an architect and a builder. Uh, he was responsible for the sundial and Ingleside terraces. 
And then these are the third group of what I'm calling the amateurs. These are new to the real estate game. They generally were rich men, entrepreneurs. They call themselves capitalists, a proud uh, capitalists because they had capital, money, that they could invest in things. And they had usually a lot of business interests. And they got into uh, these residence parks because this was the thing to do. So one of them was a millionaire son in Jordan Park. A cattle rancher uh, in Marin Terrace, which is very now part of West Portal. A haberdasher uh, in Claremont Court, which is now West Portal. Uh, even the Archdiocese of San Francisco was a developer of St. Mary's Park. They actually, I went to their archives, and the deeds are with the mortgages are held, the deeds and the mortgages are held by the Archdiocese. Uh, and then so, sewing machine salesmen um, in uh, several developments here, which is sort of loosely now forced, part of Forest Hill Extension. And I'm going to talk more about him because he's quite a character. Uh, here he is, uh, Charles Hawkins. I'm sure this is a household name. Um, I saw his name in ads for years and I didn't really know who he was. He's quite a character. Um, and he. Uh, Many things. He started off hustling pool in Texas, then became a Texas Ranger. That didn't work out. A sewing machine salesman. He was quite successful in that. And then became a truck uh, executive with white white trucks. Does anyone anyone know that truck? Uh, and he evidently developed himself a very good axle. It was very strong, and it gave white trucks an advantage for many years. But then World War II came and he couldn't sell his land, so he got in the munitions business and moved to Ohio making guns for the Allies. Uh, an inventor, I mentioned the truck thing, a banker, all these guys had some interest in a small bank, it seems like. And then real estate developer. And he finally died as a big grower president. <laughs> wow. And now this the, the reason we know so much about him, uh, thanks for asking, is that uh, he, 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 there's an oral history. His granddaughter was gave an oral history, and it's in the San Francisco Library. Most of these guys, I, can't, I don't have a lot of color because there's nothing. They didn't leave any records. There's no diaries. There's no letters to, you know, whatever. So anyway, so we know a little bit about him. Um, and this is I'm going to just do a couple of his developments. This is the one that is now called part of uh, Forest Hill Extension, but it actually started out. In 1914, it was going to be El Portal Park. Now, they all had park or terrace, and I said. And it took me a while to figure out, he even, not quite hyphenated, but he has a space between the floor and the toe. And it was because he, he thought, and they thought, that the tunnel, the Twin Peaks Tunnel, was going to end at Forest Hill Station and not just be a station. So, and it was going to be the first door portal you could get in. So again, he kind of copied what they were doing in Forest Hill, you know, across the street with big urns and landscaping and this uh, you know, the, uh, pillars with uh, you know planted plants on it. Well, the timing was bad. The Peninsula War One came along, and he couldn't get off the ground with this. I mean. He became an munitions worker, but he held on to the land. Then after World War I, things were booming in the 20s. You know the Roaring 20s? There used to be a TV show or something. I was too young, I can't remember that. But uh, and they really were the Roaring 20s for real estate, and not in San Francisco, California, nationwide. So he got on that, on, trying to unload this property now, renamed it Laguna Honda Park. Because, again, park's in the title, but it's near Laguna Honda Hospital, near Laguna Honda Volvo. Uh, so we're kind of using that name near Laguna Honda, the lake. So, um, but at this point, it's Hawkins Improvement Company. So he is the owner, but he is selling lots to whoever builders, you know, come and get. He wasn't building all the houses, and um, it's just you know it's just too much really for a, a small firm, but. Um, uh, it still was going to uh, maintain this detached houses and the look, at least, of, of the residence park. Now, uh, this 
uh, is a kind of a, it's a, a little bit of a park in um, his development. It's really a leftover triangle, triangular piece of land that wasn't built on. And the residents in the, uh, in the 20s uh, got together and built a sort of landscape to themselves. And they uh, built this monument uh, to, uh, well, actually, one of the residents said his son died in, uh, on Guam Canal in World War II. And he built this monument to his son. Uh, this is in 2008. And, it fallen into disuse, as you can see. And this uh, neighborhood uh, doesn't have uh, dues like some of them. So like St. Francis Wood has mandatory dues you must pay, sort of like an HOA. And they use the money to keep up the place. It varies across the residence parks. Uh, and these, uh, this one really doesn't have that. Uh, but I'm proud to say that the neighbors got together and worked with. Uh, Department of Public Works, I think, ch chipped in some dough, and they uh, fixed it up, and restored it. They, they they didn't restore the fountain because uh, it's just plumbing. When you have plumbing as long as water running, it's very expensive and take plumbing. So we didn't get the the fountain running, but they did a great job, and that's true of many of these residence parks today. They have a, a kind of a community spirit, whether or not they have dues. And many of them realize that they live in a special place, and they're willing to uh, chip in and work together to uh, maintain it. So uh, we're almost near the end. I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, one of the landscape architects that was involved in some of the residence parks. He was, if you believe his resume, and I guess we do, there's been a lot written about him lately. He was very active in the state of California, not just San Francisco. He kind of started on the East Bay. He worked in several of the residence parks. He did not lay out the streets for Sea Cliff or St. Mary. See that in, on, the, on, the, on the, the web? That's not true. He did a garden in Sea Cliff, but he didn't lay out the streets. Uh, but he did design the streets, the curved streets, and Forest Hill, the very curvy streets. They were so curvy, they didn't meet the city's requirements, and they were privately maintained until the 70s. And, uh, the, the, the residents wanted to unload the streets to anyone here from Forest Hill before I go on. Uh, um, they, it's no secret, they wanted the city to take you know, the expense of taking it over. But anyway, it was a, he was a, he does a lot of what I'm going to call a sort of Beaux Arts design, very curves, lots of curves, circles, curved streets. Um, in fact, he was asked to do a design for Lake Merced. This is 1916. So he's got a street, a road, a grand, I should use the French word for it. Um, it was very French inspired. A grand boulevard going all the way across Lake Merced. There'd be a bridge here, you know, and then, oh, what's the round point? Can you say the round point in French? Say again. Yeah, that real dark and all pong, pong. Um, and but well, they used that word when they would do these designs. So it's not I'm not making this up. Uh, but anyway, nothing came of this. There were many plans for like you said that came to nothing. But um, he was asked to do that. Then he was asked to take over the former exposition grounds and on Pacific 1915. It was a temporary thing. So uh, but it was very popular, and you know, was, uh, then they, there was popular uh, enthusiasm for keeping some of the uh, buildings or, or uh, monuments from the fair, the, the, you know, the Palace of Fine Arts. But they were also going to keep two other things, this, this column of progress tower thing. Sorry for the bad photo, I think I have a better one coming up. Anyway, he was asked to, to look at that, what could you do? And he said, well, listen, I can tell you. This is great, yeah, I can, I can handle this. So his first design, this is the marina by the way today, so is uh, the round point, the round point, long points. Oh, man. <laughs> All those years are French for that thing. But anyway, uh, uh, so you see, it's very axial, you know, but think of Paris, you know, think of the axial boulevards. 
leak to something and leak to a view. Um, here's the build, a building that's going to be maintained in the street. You have an axial road going to the Palace of Fine Arts. And then you just have this big circular thing for the fun of it, you know, to make it again something different, something grand. Well, the land was owned by many different property owners. And, you know, they didn't have the vision, shall we say. They said, this is too ambitious, it's going to cost too much. Can we uh, just look at the top view for, for a minute? It was revised and kind of made less grandiose. We still have a curved street, um, or semicircular, and we have all these arrows you know, pointing to things so that we would have the, the uh, something to look at. But even that proved too much for at least half the property owners. Because as you look at the one on the bottom, you have a remnant of Daniel's design with this curved street. And I was always curious, why is this curved this way? And then there's an angular thing. So it's, it's half of his design. At least the streets part was maintained. It's not a residence park. It never was. It didn't have any of the restrictions. You see, you know, apartments and flats and houses and everything else. So there's no landscaping. There's no setbacks like a residence park. But it's part of the street design survived, but only part. Unfortunately, the part that uh, leads to the Palace of Fine Arts, you know, this was the main thing that the city saved in 1915 because everyone loved it so much. And then it was falling down, and in the early 60s, again, the city actually the voters voted money, uh, as well as, I can't remember his name, um, who uh, loved it too and gave a lot of his money. It was rebuilt, and it's been rebuilt again. So this is a big deal. Now it's the site of a lot of car breaking, but uh, we love it, and this was a big deal. This is a very unusual thing to have in any in San Francisco. Uh, it's such a grand thing that is just for looks. There's no function really. I mean, you sort of had the exploratorium in the back for a few years. But okay, so we want to we want to really capitalize on this, and we want to have a grand street that leads up to it, so you know you're arriving at something that's a destination. But what we have is. A, we don't have that because this part of the marina, they just extended the grid, the Western Edition grid, on the same uh, scale, the same plan, and they ignored it as if it wasn't there. So you can't even, I mean, it's hard even to see on a block, a block and a half away. The trees don't help, but even if the trees weren't there, it's like you would never, they would never do this in France, really, or anywhere. Uh, so, or maybe even Washington, D.C., I don't know. But anyway, so it doesn't always uh, work out uh, uh, the way you know uh, you might plan it. Um, so who lived in residence parks? Um, this is always a, a hot issue. Um, and at the time I mentioned, you know, it was like company officers, presidents of local businesses, uh, vice presidents, uh, a lot of doctors and lawyers, uh, not the super rich. There were many first-time homeowners who were living in a, in a, in a, a rental and renting some place. It's hard to find data like this, but I looked through a lot of newspaper listings and when they would announce, you know, and this is so, so perhaps, and I would you could sometimes find where they were before, and it was in the Western edition, and it was in a flat. You could see that. So you can see it was, it was achieving this goal of, of having home ownership. Clearly, very designed for families. All the ads talk about a good place to raise kids, and you know, the good marine air for the kids, or you know, the quiet streets. Uh, and again, only whites, no African Americans or Asians, uh, until really the '60s. And I, I'm sure you're gonna have questions about that later. So um, maybe I'll talk about that then. But and I always get this question: Jews were okay. There was no prohibition in the deeds prohibiting Jews, as opposed to other parts of the country that did. Uh, now, there could have been informal um, uh, steering away, of, but you know, but it wasn't in the deeds. Uh, and so, what do we get from all of this effort? Um, it's, I'm saying, a gift to the city. There's about my rough count, maybe 7,500 houses that were built in this time period. 
And they are, you know, they're very nice areas. There's landscaping, they're all attached. Uh, they are uh, exclusive, um, but not the super rich. Because uh, I give you the example here, Seacliff, which is it is the super rich. Um, and now things, everybody's just, just, everybody seems to have more money than, than they used to. Uh, but these neighborhoods have long term stability. Uh, you'd, you'd be surprised, you really don't see any that are really right now. Uh, even if they don't have the homeowners association to kind of help things along. And there was a period in the 60s and 70s when they did get run down, particularly St. Francis Wood. Um, and the residents got together and said, we've got, to, we've got to keep this place up. We've got to fix the plumbing and the landscaping and raise the dues. And they did, and it's kind of a renaissance. Um, so uh, the reason why this is sort of important uh, historically is that after this, we kind of went back to the grid. This is a post-war sunset district with a lot of uh, uh, rows of houses, you know, more or less uh, I, was, I, I don't want to be too unkind, you know, to the same design. When you actually get and walk down the streets, you do see a little more variety than this photo suggests. But these were done, this was affordable housing. This was post-war affordable housing. Uh, low down payments and a lot of small houses, you know, a thousand square foot, two bedroom, which now we would think, oh, oh, and one bathroom, how do people look like that? Uh, <laughs> But it, it was definitely affordable and it definitely helped uh, with the housing needs. And then I should add, many of the features of residence parks, the detached housing, the setbacks, gradually in the 20s and 30s became just part of some FHA requirements. So there wasn't a need for the developer to write a deed in the sale of the property to do this. It became more of a city or uh, function to plan uh, communities. So that concludes my talk on the residence parks. Now I do have keep the lights show. The mo maybe the most important part of the show is is just about to start. Uh, my book is available in the back, but my next book is going to be about uh, the 250-year-old Portola Drive, which was a Spanish trail linking Mission Dolores to Daly City. Trust me on this, I don't want to work on this. I, I can prove it. Uh, it was like a secondary road because everyone knows about, you know, San Jose uh, Avenue being the main road. Opening. But here it is. It's coming. It, we're looking at sort of Twin Peaks and the, the road is curving over to. Uh, Mission Dolores is right here. So it came over here, it actually went to about 19th Street. Anyway, uh, I don't take too much time. It was overload in the 1860s, uh, leading to the resorts. The resort, there were two resorts by Lake Merced and the old racetrack. Not the side racetrack, this is the one before that. Uh, and then this is just that the Portola um, or upper market was extended in the 20s, kind of merged into Portola. Uh, this is uh, 1946. I can't believe there's not that much houses up there. Anyway, but it was a narrow road. Uh, this is uh, upper market going into Portola. And then, of course, the white in the 50s. Uh, this was an alternative to build a freeway over Twin Peaks. Uh, so, but this was quite controversial. And I looked up, I, I couldn't believe it, but the Department of Building Inspection. If you ask them along the way with the right uh, references, they found in many cases the permits to move these houses and where they ended up. And they ended up all over San Francisco, where it was big and locked. They just used to do a lot of house moving. So I was fascinated by that. So uh, that's going to be in the book. This is just uh, uh, the beginning of Portola Drive, you know, the Twin Peaks uh, in 1969. Uh, so anyway, that, now that concludes my talk. And one more thing, one last thing, I'm getting the word here. Uh, if you're interested in the Portola Drive book, uh, I'm asking if you would want to leave your name and email, and I can let you know when the book is out or any information. So thank you.
opens up to your questions. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, please raise your hand and I'll come in, come to you with a microphone. Here you go. Hi. Is this a Okay. I was wondering how they coordinate the public transit with the building, which came, which was the chicken and which was the egg. Did the city, because I know a lot of, in 1905, all the cable car companies were private, right? They had been, wasn't municipal transit. So each company would talk to the developer and say, we're going to put a cable car line out here when you develop, before you develop, or after. I don't know how to work. Well, the best, uh, uh, I'll talk about what I know, what we do know. You know, the Twin Peaks Tunnel was talked about for many years, uh, like as early as 1909, 1910. And there was a lot of um, boosterism then, you know, these uh, neighborhood associations and the mission were eager to get a road or get a, get a transit over to open up the West of Twin Peaks. At the same time, this land became available. Sutro, uh, you know, Sutro died. His will was probated enough that they could sell the land. So the developers knew that the tunnel was building, or heard that the tunnel was going to be built, and they sort of took, I guess, a bit of a risk in thinking that the tunnel would, would be built, and that would open up the area around West Portal for uh, development. In fact, the ad said, you know, buy now because once the tunnel's open, then these prices are. Not going to last. They're going to triple in price once the tunnel opens. So it was kind of an informal thing. It wasn't, you know, um, uh, it, it wasn't deliberately planned, but it was clearly the tunnel was going to be built. Some of the other ones, it, it's just really up to developers to say, you know, this is near enough to an existing line uh, that, uh, you know, they could take a chance like the sea cliff, which was out pretty far out there, but there was already transit on um, California and Erie that went there from the private companies. Question in the front. So you said there were 36, I think, was the number. Does that mean that 36 were actually built? So there were 36 that were planned. About half of them um, were built uh, that resembled a residence park. So there were many that, that never, never broke ground. Like Marina, is, there's houses covering this, this area where there would have been a residence park, but it wasn't developed as a residence park. So 36 were planned, yeah. and about half of them were built. Yeah. So those that were built were, were more or less intact, or were some of them had given in drastic adultery? No, it's kind of amazing, but there's a tremendous uh, amount of integrity. They don't change. All these houses are pretty much as old as, you know, as built. Uh, having said that, you know, if there was a vacant lot, uh, you might see a new a 50s house or a 60s house, or in some cases, in St. Francis Wood, there were lots that were split, and you'll see a, a new house built. Um, but, uh, Generally, it was a tremendously high degree of integrity, and most of these parks were 50 miles because it started just before World War I, slow period, rapid period in the 20s, and there was build up to the 30s. So by World War II, most of these were built out. Question here? Sort of a uh, piggyback to the first question related to transit, but on a different topic. That is, um, <clears throat> uh, automobile ownership became more uh, common. And certainly for this, I guess, class of economic class of people, uh, what were the provisions for parking, uh, specifically garages, and how did they accommodate the garages? Were they attached to the units or were they detached? And did they place them in like alleys? What, what was the configuration? That's a great question, and then you answered it yourself. Uh, no. Um, so the residence parks were, you know, very dependent on public transit going, but it also coincided with automobile use and then cars were getting cheaper and more, um, more uh, in the reach of more people. So the streets, um, initially, the uh, many of the houses had didn't have a provision for, for cars really, but it also, but at the same time, there was a, uh, an acknowledgement that these cars are going to 
we need to do something with them. They're very important. So some of them have rear alleyways, so that, so that the unsightly car drives them back. Uh, then some have a garage that's detached at the, uh, you know, you come from the main street, a side uh, driveway, and there's a garage in the back. So you don't see it quite so well. So you can see a lot of detached houses, uh, garages, or garages in the rear. Um, and then some garages even that are uh, you know, uh, cut through in the front. It codes right, it's right in that time when the car becomes more popular. At the same time, these are areas are have lower density than say, you know, the Western Edition are. So you could park on the street too. Um, and at the same time, you know, there's transit's important, but these are areas that are like on the edge of San Francisco. And even to this day, car ownership is higher there because people used to drive into downtown uh, because otherwise they'd have to use the beauty. Uh, yeah, thanks for laughing. But uh, and so it was. It's an interesting thing. You'll see how they tried to accommodate that, accommodate the car in in a residence park where you, you wouldn't want to see the car. Question. Um, in the last few years, there have been very successful attempts to both statewide and locally to eliminate zoning regulations, to eliminate historic preservation, and to eliminate environmental review throughout the whole state, and especially, sadly, in relation to our supervisors in San Francisco. Uh, what impact do you think this will have on these developments? Uh, so, uh, you know, this, you bring up a good point, and I always forget, but uh, um, someone in San Francisco would keep saying, that, Richard, we have no single family zoning anymore in the state of California with the auxiliary dwelling unit. So, every lot can have two units. So, there is no single family zoning, period. Uh, now, to your question, about whether you know increasing the dense efforts to increase density will threaten the historic nature of most of these residence parks. Uh, so I know this is being recorded and streamed and everything else. Uh, I don't think it's going to have a huge impact because for many reasons, um, just the cost of acquiring these properties and then somehow putting another big unit on it. And SB nine is Senate Bill nine was. Like the first one out of the gate that tried to make it much easier. And there's a lot of requirements about minimum lot size after you split it and 40%, da, 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 da. So I don't see a huge amount, um, uh, but you know, who knows? Uh, uh, and there's still, if it's a historic district, if it's listed on the National Register, then it, it so far, it's uh, exempt from uh, Senate Bill 9. Let's jump to that. Of the original 36 um, residence parks in San Francisco, how many still have neighborhood associations and feel themselves as an entity? That, uh, I don't know. That's a good question. There's, I don't think there's that many. Well, there's degrees. So um, even if they don't have uh, a neighborhood association that collects dues, like, um, um, well, now it's considered part of Forest Hill, but that example with the fountain, with the fountain that they Restore. They certainly feel like they're in a neighborhood, and uh, uh, you know they feel that, it's, that they're in a special community. But I don't have a percentage for you. Uh, but it's. I think many of them do. Uh, it's just that their, you know, their legal structure varies from you know very very strong to very weak. But a lot of them have associations or even websites, you know, about different neighborhoods. So it's hard to say. But I think there's a lot of feeling that they're in a a special neighborhood. Question in the back. Do you have a favorite uh, residence park? <laughs> oh, no, I, I love them all. <laughs> well, actually, I'm in a residence park. I live in one. So, have you ever heard of Claremont Court? Nope. No, of course not. <laughs> Neither, when I bought the house. Uh, but it's just part of Westport. You 
and uh, in the 60s, things started to change. That, like, folks are going to move in, I guess. Could you tell us more about that? And also, related to who lives there now? Uh, so, um, this is great. I think you can hear the question, right? So, I don't have to repeat. So, there was, um, this is a very brief overview of a very complicated subject, but it was you could legally discriminate uh, up until, uh, let's see, um, up until 1917, the municipality could discriminate. Then that was declared illegal by the Supreme Court. So, you couldn't have uh, municipal uh, discrimination, but you could still have private discrimination until 1948. The Supreme Court said, you can't have, you cannot enforce these deeds that restrict certain people on the basis of race from buying there because to do so, you would have to go to court and have the deed uh, enforced. And if you go to court, then you're using the state to enforce this discrimination, and state discrimination is illegal. Okay, so that's a milestone, although not too much really happened. Uh, but then in uh, 1964 or three, California passed the FC Unruh Civil Rights Act, and that was a year before the federal one. That made it illegal for private discrimination. You couldn't, you know, uh, um, you, know, you own your, your castle, your home is your castle, and you can sell it to whoever you want. That became illegal at that point. But again, that's just the law. You know, you could still informally discriminate, which went on for, I don't know, how many years? Or still going to it. But the legal, but it's no longer legal. You can't legal. Oh, and then you asked, I do have a demographic thing here. Uh, uh, this is, um, years old, but it's the demographic of some of the residence parks. Um, and I'll just let you read that over because it's kind of hard, kind of hard to read all of these things. But you know, it's still uh, so the San, San Francisco numbers are on the far left. That's for the whole San Francisco. So at this time, 40% of San Francisco was white. And then you see the percentages across the top. So it's still pretty much you know, we go from high white in <laughs> sea cliff to very low emission terrorists. And then we're sort of average, and you can just see the numbers. So it's it's certainly more mixed than it was in 1912. Um, uh, I don't know. It's whatever, however they answered the question. Oh, well, it could be. Yeah, I don't know. Richard, I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, I'm wondering which of these projects um, Julian Morgan was involved with, and also were several architects uh, working together on a design, or was it a, one particular architect that was featured in these particular uh, proposals? Okay, let me take your first picture. I forget your second question. Oh, have we got <laughs> Uh, well, so yes, Julie Morgan uh, was involved in several of the residence parks. She's got three designs in St. Francis Wood. I don't know how many in Jordan Park. Um, I'm not sure about Bruce Hill. Uh, and then um, another woman architect, Ida McCain, did a lot of designs in several residence parks. Westwood Park, she did, I don't know, hundreds of designs. Uh, Lincoln Manor. As well, um, the developer liked her and used her a long time for his design. She was almost a track architect at the time, so she's the one. And then went and worked for other uh, for a male architect, most famously um, Henry Gutterson, who's actually a Berkeley architect, who was the tracks architect for St. Francis Wood, and his firm hired women and. Um, so that it kind of slides into your next question. So you'll see in Prince St. Francis Wood, there's um, I kind of, kind of forget now about 83 designs that are credited to his to Henry Gutterson. But it's really the firm. So other than it's, it's, it's the you know the business model. But his name was on the principal's name goes on all the plans, and other people are doing a lot of the 
design works, but he's looking it over and they know what kind of work the firm he does. So we don't know um, in, in many cases unless you really dig who some of these other people were. But there's a great book um, by uh, um, this is terrible. Um, Women Architects of the Bay Area it came out a few years ago. And um, Inga, Horton, Inga Horton wrote it. And she did a tremendous job of tracking down all of the women architects who worked for other women architects. Like a lot of women worked for um, Judy Morgan, for her firm, as well as men. And so she traces all that. But it's a great, if you're interested in the subject, it's quite extensive. It's really illuminating. And so it's also, these are historical, are they deemed as historic landmarks? And if yes, what kind of adaptation or limitations to adaptation are required for these locations? So some of uh, the people are formerly um, listed on the National Register of our historic districts. And in historic districts, you, um, uh, the exterior changes are tightly limit. Um, you can do additions in the back that don't, don't show from the public right away. To the, you can do anything you want on the inside. You can blow it up. Do anything you want. Tear the walls out. As someone was mentioning earlier about the, all the nice woodwork inside a lot of the Westwood um, Park houses. There's no protection for those at all, even if it was in a historic district. So you can, people get all excited about, I have to control my house. My rent. Well, first of all, this is the, uh, you, you don't have control over your house anyway, whether it's a historic or not. City planning uh, has tremendous control over what you can and can't do to your house anyway. Uh, so uh, in a historic district, it's more tightened, and you have to go through permits and it has to be reviewed. Um, and, and windows are the big, don't, don't replace the windows, just, just saying, it saves you a lot of money. Just <laughs> put drapes over if you're worried about the energy loss. Don't, don't work, don't do that. Uh, I will, can I just do one more thing though? Because this is what people don't know. If you go on the planning department's website, um, you can look up the properties, and they have maps, and they're quite good at a lot of stuff. The city has designated many, many, many neighborhoods as eligible historic districts under the California Register. Eligible. So they have never been designated that by any board of supervisors or even planning department of the Historic Preservation Commission. But planning considers them to be historic. So if you wanted to replace your windows, put an addition in the front, or do anything, they will subject you to the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, even if you are not in a designated district. So that's just the San Francisco uh, wrinkle. Anyone else have a question in the back? I got, yes, I got very interested in the subject through Park Gell in Barcelona. Uh, the idea that an architect as famous as Antonio Gaudi would design houses for a project like this. But the idea that was particularly interesting about that to me was that the, uh, they wanted people to be able to have gardens or even little sort of truck farms and give them enough land so that they could uh, sustain themselves. And I wondered to what extent was that a factor in any of these projects here? And is it still at all? Is there a farming aspect? Uh, there's, there was only a farming aspect during World War One, when they couldn't sell the lots and they were uh, encouraging people to have victory gardens, I think, in Cracker Amazon. Um, but no, in fact, that you couldn't do any uh, animal husbandry in your in your area. It was forbidden to do any agriculture work. Um, I mean, you could have a garden, I guess, suppose it grew vegetables, but no chickens, no other, nothing like that. You're definitely not, we don't want to see any sheds and hay and stuff. This is going to be, we're going to live in a park. We're not going to live in, in, a, in a barnyard. 
Um, Richard, I have another question related to the mechanics institute. I'm wondering if Arthur Matthews and his wife who had um, the store that could be, they would build all the, uh, the built-ins. So I'm wondering about the interior design of these, of these homes. And if uh, Matthews was involved, of course he was involved very much so with the 1915 Pan Pacific um, Festival exposition. And also Arthur Matthews' uh, beautiful mural and painting is standing in our lobby. So I want you to go out and take a look at it before you leave. Anyway, was there an involvement in terms of the interior design? Uh, as far as I can tell, it was just up to the architect that designed the building to do the interior. If they did anything other than, you know, just a, a fireplace or something. Um, there are built-ins, though, but it's an area that I really don't know too much about. But this Arthur Matthews, did, did he do a, a, there's a mural in the Lane Medical Library, the same time? The same time. Okay. Which is the start, by the way. I, I have another question. Another question here. Yes, I wonder if there are any tours to some of these places that also go inside. Very, very rarely do we get to go inside. It's very rare. There are tours of the outside, but it's, and I, I think even getting rarer. Uh, I, I could make a plug, though, for the Northern California chapter of the Archi uh, Society of Architectural Historians, of which I am the president. Uh, which is a very long name, but we do do two tours a year, and sometimes we go inside. But it's, and we only limited to 30 people, and our, we, our members sell out instantly. So uh, it's very, it's very difficult. And I know the Victorian Alliance does uh, tours, house tours. I don't know, I think they go inside. Um, they do, yeah. Uh, so it, it happens, it, it can occur, but it's, it's relatively. Uh, this will be our last question in the back because we want to have time for everyone to take a look at the book and the Bible. Last question. Yes. Um, when I talked to some people who lived in San Francisco in the first part of the 20th century, they said that San Francisco, one of the veins of living here, was sand. That the sand blew um, all the time and um, it was you constantly were sweeping your houses out. And that the houses on the near the parade ground and presidio actually were all turned away from the ocean because the housewives were complaining that all they ever did was uh, sweep sand. So I was wondering if when they're building all these residence parks, there's still a lot of vacant sandy lots in San Francisco. So how do they deal with that? Plant eucalyptus or what? <laughs> well, uh, they never mentioned they never mentioned that in any ad. <laughs> Lots of sun. Um, no, it was an issue, uh, you know, in the 18th, 19th century, downtown San Francisco, the sand thing blowing all over. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I didn't really. Uh, St. Francis Wood was was run over, uh, overrun by gophers. <laughs> And, uh, and there was a vegetable farm across the street on um, sort of Juniper Sarah and uh, Slowed and there. And at one time they had uh, flies came in the house, uh, which is not in the book, by the way. Uh, but I did, yeah, you know, you'd think there would be more with, with sand coming in. But uh, they didn't do anything obvious to block the sand. Like they didn't build, you know, road, the plant rows of trees, particularly like on the edge of it. So it's a good question. Well, with that, you don't want to blow away in the sand. So <laughs> we want to thank uh, Richard Granny for his wonderful talk, um, very informative and expansive on um, the garden neighborhoods of San Francisco. And thank you for joining us.